No. Uh oh. <laughs> no, we're pretty low key. <laughs> Sometimes we've gotten ourselves into trouble about what we think we would like to do in the future and how audiences take it as if that's what's going to happen in the future. It gets us in a lot of hot water. You've locked yourself in now. <laughs> um, so, hello. Welcome to Tales from the Rift. My name is Jen. I play the news reporter August Potts on the scripted Portalville podcast series. Uh, I'm John. I write and produce the show. And I got to give a shout out to our uh, sponsor for today. It's Cocolero. Uh, you can go on right now to their website. I think they have the uh, limited edition Resident Evil bottles. So go check those out. Pretty cool. What was that? A shampoo? What? What, what is it? <laughs> you try it like that. Yeah. It's a South American liqueur, and it's like just got here to uh, the United States, but it's like yeah. the best selling of all time in Japan. They're really big over there. They're so. trying to break into the U.S. market. Yeah. Well, now, now you did it justice. Okay. <laughs> um, so, and then one, one other thing that we wanted to mention is we just launched a new website, um, www.portavillepodcast.com. Uh, we've got features that'll be up and running. Um, we have guest profiles, bonus videos, character blogs, um, that sort of thing. And uh, today we have multiple special guests coming through the rift. I can tell Steven's excited. Um, <laughs> three brothers whose careers span almost 40 years, um, film, animation, worked on Critters franchise, and uh, we noticed Team America, love those puppets, <laughs> Elf, um, the stop motion for Elf. Uh, uh, and then also the cult phenomenon, killer clowns from outer space, um, Edward, Charles, and Steven, welcome. Hello. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. How are you? Uh, Good. Thanks for coming on our show. The Chiodo Brothers Productions. Yes. <laughs> um, so let's start off by getting to know you a bit. Um, what inspired the Chiodo brothers to uh, get into the film industry? Uh, can you tell us how your careers began? I know that you started with Critters uh, is the first like film effects gig where you all did it together. Oh, well, well, starting goes way back, right, Stephen? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, we can start at the beginning. I give you a quick overview. Yeah. We started way back when we were little kids. It was a form of play for us. We used to make movies in our basement when we lived in New York. Oh. Yeah, there was a thing in New York City called uh, uh, the uh, Million Dollar Movie on uh, WOR, Channel 9, and they would show Son of Kong, King Kong, Godzilla, the thing from another world. So we were bitten at a very early age by the monster bug. Yeah, that's what motivated us from the start. Making monster movies was our goal in life. <laughs> yeah, just loved, loved those movies and then tried <laughs> to emulate them through play and then trying to make our own little uh, you know, epic adventures when we were younger. You know, that's Everybody. what our son does. He loves that. Yeah, you, what they do is uh, you play with your action figures. Well, we had, uh, you know, back in the day, little uh, dinosaur sets and stuff. And we'd go, you know, we'd go into the, in, into, the, into the woods or into the excavations where they're building houses in the sand pits where other kids played with army soldiers. We take army soldiers and dinosaurs and just like play all day in the dirt, you know, digging <laughs> caves and, and things. Um, and it was a it was a, a, a sense of play. Um, we didn't know that people made monster movies. And then when famous monsters came out, we saw that you know, Willis O'Brien made our favorite movie, King Kong. Ray Harryhausen made the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. And uh, you know, we started reading how you could actually make movies. And uh, where some people uh, want to become professional wrestlers, baseball players, firemen, uh, uh, lawyers, and doctors. We wanted to be monster makers <laughs> and you did yeah it succeeded <laughs> yeah yeah well so fast forward we all went to different colleges i went to rochester institute of technology to do animation and film directing charlie went to pratt institute for illustration and everybody went to how many institutes did you get kicked out of <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. you know i started to purchase uh suny purchase in new york and then graduated from hofstra with a degree in uh film and communications Yes, so then we, uh, we, we wanted to make movies. You couldn't do a lot of motion picture work on the East Coast, so we decided to move 
to California, to Hollywood, where we could make big movies. And we started that in 1980, and that's when we started our Kyoto Brothers Productions, legit, in out of Burbank, in California. Yeah, well, we wanted to make stop motion films. Uh, that was what we were playing with at, um, you know, the, the films of uh, Willis O'Brien, Ray Harryhausen, stop motion monster films. We were less, we were, we we loved uh, makeup and stuff. We did Planet of the Apes makeup tests in uh, in college, um, but. Makeup wasn't the thing that got us going. It was the stop motion animation. Uh, we grew up with Gumby, Davy, and Goliath. And we came out to uh, um, California after we did the uh, animated uh, 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 feature in Claymation. Actually, it was, uh, what do we call it? Flexiform animation for Stonewall Enterprises. Uh, we did uh, I Go Pogo. That was our first uh, feature film in stop motion. It had a, sh a very, uh, short life uh, in the theater. I don't know if it was even released, but it was our motivation to come out and do stop motion in Hollywood. Uh, when we came to Hollywood, they were doing animatronics and nobody wanted to do stop motion. So we had to learn other ways to make monsters. Yeah, so we got involved with the uh, puppets, animatronic costumes and the like um, as, a, as, a, as a special effects company. But ideally, yes, we did work on Critters. We worked on a lot of uh, other people's productions, but it always was our goal to make our own films, tell our own stories. So that was like uh, what we had in mind while we were trying to pursue a, um, a career that made money for us in the early years. Now, our first films, you know, we came out in 1980. We hooked up with a company called um, uh, Magic Lantern, and they were working on the Mel Brooks film, uh, History of the World, Part One. And uh, they were doing uh, the Jews in space uh, end sequence. Um, and we saw the blue screen and basically using the tech techniques that they used in Star Wars and, uh, and um, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. So we hooked up with this, you know, this new effects company and we were designing monsters for movies like Flicks and uh, the creature wasn't nice uh, that you might uh, have not seen. I'm a sword and a sorcerer and all things like that. Yeah. But we actually we learned a lot about movie making from working in different special effects houses in Los Angeles. That's just amazing that you've come through so much together and you've stuck together through it. You know, did you guys have any sort of uh, was there any sort of like uh, I don't know, my kids fight, so I'm just, I just yeah, picture everyone. You, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm a twin, like I have a twin brother. I cannot work with that guy. <laughs> like, like, tell us about your dynamic and working with each other just over the years. inspiration just to work with each other as a family for so long. How well, well look, go ahead, Edward. Yeah, no, I mean, again, working with, working with siblings, obviously there's a, uh, there's a shorthand uh, and then you just kind of cut through the chase of all the, pleasantries sometimes and we just get right down to the meat of the issue but I mean there's really no one else that we can rely on more than family so uh, it's been rewarding we definitely had uh, you know what's come to known as Kyoto Brother conferences that get Kyoto Brothers but uh, yeah it's uh, you know it's it, it's you know it's what we always uh, what we always wanted to do from when we were little kids uh, working together our parents supported us throughout our entire lives gave us whatever we, we needed even though they had no idea no comprehension what fascinated us and what the industry and the work would be um so it's just it's been great you know but we're fortunate that each of us have our own little uh, our different different we focus on different phases of production um i might get involved with the writing and, and uh and directing uh and also doing the animation but charlie's a production designer and character designer and edward does the uh, producing chores and does a lot of uh, the mechanics so we each have our own little spot within the special effects or the production company. And we collaborate on the creative. You know, we, act, we brainstorm and we, you know, we collaborate on the concepts and the stories that we want to do together. Yeah, we're on the, on the same page most of the time. You know, it's the details that we often disagree with. At the end of the day, you know, you have to come up with something. You have to agree. I mean, any creative collaboration, uh, 
it's got it's, it's good points and it's bad points you take all the rock groups or you know any any collaboration the studio bosses you know the, the crofts you know there's always butting heads creatively you're not going to agree on anything it's very everybody has their own ideas and everybody wants to do it you know their way but at the end of the day it has to be a cohesive thing and then you know, probably the, the biggest challenge is when you're trying to get stuff done, you have outsiders from the group, from the core group that share the, the concept that want to put their ideas into it. And that's where it starts getting in the way. It's great if they get it, but sometimes they, they're coming from another place. They don't get it. They, they you know, they, they just want to participate and they just, it's not, it's not working. So that's the difficulty. The collaboration between the brothers and the people you're making the movies for is the most difficult aspect of making films. That's what makes Hollywood difficult. Yeah, they just don't have that history, that long running relationship to be on the same page. You know, well, you know, some people, yeah, they, they yeah. want to make money. Some people are in it for the money. We want to make good movies. We want to make fun mm -hmm. monster movies. Everybody else is trying to you know, take money away from you figure out ways to cut the expenses and stuff. And often that, that, that uh, uh, you sacrifice some really beautiful stuff because you have to hit a budget, you know? Well, I mean, again, that's all. always, that's just the reality of yeah. the business, the show business. But yeah. I mean, what's really cool, like, you know, in the case of Killer Clowns, I mean, we didn't really have an agenda other than to make a movie that we would like, that we would like to go see. So, you know, that is the common ground and the, the goal, you know, works out pretty well. Yeah, just yeah. doing what you love. I mean, that's rewarding enough. And, and it's it's good what Charles mentioned about, you know, sometimes you got to put your foot down and do what you love, even though the budget's going against you, you know, if that's your life. So, well, you know, yeah, what we tried to do with the Killer Clowns was, uh, you know, we put all the films that inspired us, all the characters, the scenes and effects that inspired us to make movies in the first place. And we incorporated it into the film. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really is a passion project of all the things that really that we loved and enjoyed. And now what? Oh, 35 years plus uh, since it was been it's been made. Uh, we're really surprised at how many people enjoy it. How many people watch the film? And you didn't expect it to turn into such a cult classic that it did. Oh, never in our wildest dreams did we think it would uh, last this long in its popularity. Not just in in let's say DVD sales, but I mean the merchandise that's popping out now. How it's really become part of pop culture. Yeah. Um, when we made it, DVDs weren't even a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We signed a deal for uh, 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 that. We signed away the rights in you know in all perpetuity for media uh, uh, invented or not yet invented. Oh wow! Yeah. Standard so Hollywood throughout the universe in perpetuity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. standard Hollywood I deal. I didn't when it know comes what direct, perpetuity when was direct brain input. We don't get a piece of that either. <laughs> Um, oh, okay. So we're already talking about killer clowns. That was going to be my next question. I'm easily <laughs> distracted because I just get into yeah, it. Yeah, they actually already covered my yeah. other question was like what you guys all do as part so of Kyoto Brothers. So. You mentioned, this was a question I had when I was watching Killer Clowns. You mentioned this. He didn't want me to ask it. I don't know. You'll have to. You'll have to ask him why I don't want me to ask these things. But I wanted to see if you were drawing from um, other iconic hits of the time like for example it was a stephen king book uh released a couple of years before the movie and then you had star wars turned really big you know and all the space movies were just huge in the 80s i wanted to see if you had like a specific sort of like inspiration um you mentioned that you were inspired by movies like what those were oh well uh, i think we were inspired by the same things that inspired stephen king and george lucas all back to the 50s and 60s sci-fi so films like uh, uh, The Thing from Another World with James Arness, that was a big film. Forbidden Planet yeah. was a big inspiration. And you can see elements of those films in our film. The blob, you know, the, oh, you know, yeah. the narrative of the blob is so, you know, it clowns is based on it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, it's the, uh, the inspiration. It's reinventing the stuff that inspired you as a kid. Yeah. And uh, we just take it and we just put a little Kyoto spin on it. Oh, yeah, even Warner about Brothers about Looney Tunes. I mean, th yeah. there was uh, the footprints in the jail cell. That was from the Duck Twacy cartoon in, in for Looney Tunes when Daffy Duck was a detective. I mean, so these are things we thought were funny, and we said, hey, let's kind of put that into this film because it had a carnival circus type 
um, background that could really incorporate anything. So yeah, and as far as like you know, it you know, Pennywise that didn't really hit my radar. I, I you know I didn't wasn't reading Stephen King at the time. That didn't hit my radar until our friends at Fantasy Two were doing the the visual effects for the the TV the miniseries. Yeah, yeah. yeah we were actually we visited uh, uh, Fantasy Two. Uh, Gene Warren, who did the effects on Killer Clowns, and uh, all our friends were sitting there. They were they were working on the giant spider creature at the end. There, they were doing all of that stuff. We were able to, you know, see a lot of our our favorite hit monster movies being done in the '80s. You know, in in the early '80s um, at Fantasy Two. Yeah, but besides amazing. the besides the connection with Fantasy Two and the visual effects on both Clowns and It, Bart Mixon, who uh, he who did uh, created Pennywise. He designed the Tim Curry makeup. Uh, uh -huh. He worked on clowns. He made the giant clown hand that for Clownzilla. <laughs> he, he, ran, he worked on our shop, uh, ran our shop for uh, Ernest Scared Stupid. So we got to work with, you know, all of Bart Mixon's uh, uh, associates and friends, all talented uh, sculptors, mold makers, painters. Uh, I got to say, we got to work with some of the best talent in Hollywood. Well, and that was really great. That's what gave us the production value of Killer Clowns because the special effects community is a pretty small community of artists who just love filmmaking and effects. And uh, so when we started to do our Killer Clowns film, we kind of tapped into that talent pool. And like Charlie said, it was some of the best. Joe Viscosal, who won Academy Award for Star Wars, he blew up our ice cream truck. Uh, I mean, really top-notch people. Gene Warren Jr., I mean, Academy Award winner. He did all the special effects and perspective shots and opticals in the show. Um, a great bunch of people, lovely people, and, and we had so much fun making the film. Did, did all three of you uh, collaborate on the designs of the clowns? Because they're like iconic, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a great word. You know what? Um, I did the uh, original drawings. I remember Steven said, you know, because I was I mean, we were drawing some, you know, things that look like mannequins and dummies and dolls and stuff. And then Steven told me, he said, you know what, whatever you do, he said, just do the basic shapes, do a round head, do an oval head, do a peanut head, do a do a, a, a triangle, and then do an upside down triangle so that when they're silhouetted, uh, you can see them in silhouette in the shadows. And that was a, a good thing because I put the character in the basic geom geometric shapes and uh, and that worked. The, uh, the characters came from um, you know, the inspiration from Looney Tunes and the Warner Brothers and, and the Disney films, you know, the greatest designers, you know, cartoon character designers of all time. So, yeah, it's an inspiration, you know, from all all of that. Mel Blanc, uh, you know, the, the voice characteristics, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the critter came from uh, um, the Tasmanian Devil, you know, all oh, that yeah. influences of the 60s, you know. Yeah. Mm. yeah so, so, so they had four basic clown designs um that we would uh we in inverted change interchangeable ears different sized noses and things and those created uh from those four basic sculptures we created eight basic clowns that populated the movie then background clowns and things would derive and the clownzilla was a unique design that charlie came up with which was uh you know our uh, homage to uh you know godzilla the giant monster yeah so have you considered creating a uh uh, Mr. Potato Head version, so we can all create our own uh, version of of a killer clown. The different right. little pieces. I'm sure somebody has some some stuff going well, probably, on. Spirit um, Halloween will probably be coming out with that uh, this this year. Who knows? Have that good merch. Yeah, I'd buy it. I just saw I just saw some new uh, Spirit uh, uh, Spirit Halloween uh, designs coming out of uh, some of the clown characters, oh. and they look great. Like animatronics. No, they're uh, eight-inch figures. I heard. Okay. Yeah, I don't oh, think there's oh. a spirit. I think that's uh, uh, one of the other studios. They do really good work. Yeah. So I mean, the spirit, you know, killed it this last Halloween. They came out with some great product. It's a cocoon it's gun. Who would have thought that uh, after 35 years, somebody would actually manufacture a cocoon gun? And they were very popular. You, they didn't stay on the shelves very long. You couldn't find them anymore. So mm -hmm. hopefully. Uh, by next October, we'll see even a, a, a greater uh, product line for clowns. Oh, well, the, the thrill is, yeah, the thrill is that, um, you know, we made a, a, it was our first film. We made a film that we wanted to see. 
uh, it has our our Only sense of humor, and, yeah, and our sense and sensibilities. Yeah, you know, it, it's unfortunate that uh, you know we knew that it had the potential, but it wasn't marketed, you know, uh, the way it should have been. But uh, the thrill is, 33 years later, it's a an 80s cult classic, and the merchandising is more popular than ever. So we're thrilled that Clowns is going to be going on beyond us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's thrilling. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Edward, you mentioned you're only one. So I was going to ask, like, you know, can you give us details about the follow-up Killer Clowns movie? <laughs> What have you heard? <laughs> this is where we get into hot water when we start heard, talking about it. I heard Keep Steven it. specifically say that it was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I know. This we'll gets me in trouble. We'll link something out. We'll edit this. In my perverted mind, I think, look, we're hopeful. We had an idea for a sequel right out of the gate, right after we finished the first film. And we had a sale at USA. Uh, cable to do something but like Hollywood the deals don't always work and things fall through for one reason or another but we've been pitching it ever since so like over 30 years we've been pitching an idea um, but maybe with the increased popularity through merchandising and, and uh, just visibility I think it's made some people kind of open up their eyes to the perspective that put for, for the prospects of this property I mean was it uh, last year two years ago a couple of years ago a universal uh, city in um, in Orlando and in LA had a, a nightmare haunt at the Universal uh, uh, haunt. Yeah. It was killer clowns and it was very popular and I think people realized, hopefully the people at MGM realized that this is a viable IP that they could exploit. So all the ideas that have been percolating over the last 30 years or so we have incorporated into a large-scale epic uh, you know, I mean, a trilogy in four parts. Yeah, we're always we're always in conversation with with them over there. You know, it's uh, it's it's complicated. Uh, the movie business is complicated, and uh, you know who knows? Uh, never say never. You know, in some ways, you know, maybe Killer Clowns is just destined to be the one and only. You know, people are, you know, so you come back and do a sequel, or remake, a reboot, or requel. We call it. You know, who knows? It might it might tarnish the original. So maybe it's better left alone. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah, we were we were always yeah hoping, lightning in a bottle yeah yeah we were all hoping that that uh in in all the years in the 20 years or more that we've been pitching ideas that we would have the person across the table who's maybe hit their son loves the movie and he says hey guys i just let's what can we how can we do this thing but we never had that person across the the table they always saw it as something that didn't make money and they weren't willing to invest i think uh what we needed to do it a really a really good movie you know and uh um i think now because there's profit being made i think they see that they can be making money and unfortunately it's not the idea that sells things it's if they think they can make money off the bottom line yeah it's a business i mean i understand it's it's, it's, it's show business so i understand that yeah so I, I think uh we're still out there you know we're, we're we're hopeful we have we keep the conversations alive who knows it's uh you know even the original was um a, a stroke of luck being in really the classic being at the right place at the right time you know the the home video market was booming just home you know vhs tapes video stores were you know starting to be everywhere uh, a friend happened to know somebody who had to come into a credit line to make you know low budget low budget genre movies uh, we got the introduction. Fred Fuchs brought us into uh, Transworld Entertainment, you know, pitched it off of a 25 page treatment, a poster Charlie had done and a sculpture of maquette Stephen had done, sold it in the room, you know, for a video sale, something to populate videotapes on a shelf. And, uh, you know, so who knows? There might, maybe there's an opportunity with streaming being as popular as it is right now in uh, the 80s movies. Uh, it, might, it might come around. You never know. Well, yeah, and there's like a whole kind of a genre out there right now. It's kind of like, you know, you ever, you ever seen Psycho Gorman? I don't, don't know that one. No, I don't. There's like a whole, yeah. yeah, there's like a whole bunch of like these, um, like 80s style comedy horror movies coming out right now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe now is the time to try. MGM, going. yeah. Come on, MGM. Hey, you know, you know <laughs> I, I don't know. Oh. I, haven't, I haven't watched it, but the new ch Chainsaw 
that come out there you know people love it people hate it, it actually sounds uh, like more places. people hate it than <laughs> than like it you know I, I don't know sometimes it's i don't know maybe clowns is just better left where it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well you know what I got, I got a weird question before you get into your next question oh go ahead um so you know in killer clowns you guys had all these awesome creative clown kills you know like like the uh the cocoon guns and the popcorn and the ventriloquism part yeah like, are there any other creative ideas you guys had for ways the clowns would kill people that you haven't told any about anybody about? You know? Yeah, we saved it for the sequels. Yeah, yeah, yeah we have tons. Yeah, we have a whole circus full. <laughs> we saved it for the, the TV series. You know? Um, you well, know, that, that was yeah, that was the idea. Well, I think you hit it on the head. It's uh, what we took was we took normal uh, uh, circus motifs and carnival gags and we turned them into kills. So we called them candy coated kills. So now what you could do is you can kind of laugh while people are getting killed in these horrible ways. Yeah, when, and then you throw in like novelty toys as an extension, anything playful, fun, carnival like, cl you know, clown like, you know, you just find out what what's the deadly edge to that. Yeah, like a balloon dog. People. You okay. have a, like a childhood experience relating to carnivals and clowns that uh, that you're tapping into here to get the all fear, of your the fear of clowns. Some something uh, something scarring perhaps in your past where well, three of you went to a carnival and. Well, I would I wouldn't say he's scarring for life, but I do recall going to Madison Square Garden when I was very young. It must have been like four or maybe five at the most. And uh, the clowns would come up to you and do their funny stuff at you, but they would get in your personal space, and it made me feel uncomfortable when a clown got really close to me. But I would look around and I would see my parents and everybody else laughing, so they're laughing while I'm feeling anxious and 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 fearful inside. And I think that's kind of what we tried to bring to the film. All the clown costume clown, clown characters are really tall, making the people look like they're small and like children. Um, so playing upon what I think. A lot of people have that kind of, yeah, I mean, not, that, not that they're afraid of clowns, they're just kind of anxious around them. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, have, do have a, a fear of clowns, you know, they're just, they're, they're uncomfortable about them. What, what are they hiding, you know, what's behind the, the makeup and the mask, you know, that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, I didn't know if maybe you had some sort of circus that you were a part of for a short stint and you didn't want to tell anyone. But... <laughs> Bad experience. <laughs> Don't no, know. Like it's a circus. <laughs> we want to run away from the circus. <laughs> you know, it's it's the um, just the images, the color, the 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 entertainment. You know, the the emotions of being in the circus. I remember walking into Madison Square Garden in the huge auditorium. All I saw was things moving down on the arena. Uh, the three rings, the bright colored lights, and music, and it just it's just a, a fun thing. The big inspiration uh, that, that ties to it is the, my, our favorite rides at the amusement parks were dark rides where you go in and you see fluorescent, it's black limbo and you're seeing black, you know, painted figures and props and scenery. And it's very controlled and, and creepy. I remember those rides, you know, uh, fun house. very young. Yeah. And we basically brought that to the, that was the design motif of inside the clown ship, black limbo with fluorescent, you know, bright colored, colored things. So we brought a lot of what affected us as kids into, into our, into that movie. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Nightmare you know, Funhouse. As much as like we get a bad rap for destroying clowns for people, clowns, on the other hand, love the movie. There's <laughs> in fact just about every clown I've ever met you know love the movie there's only one clown that has ever voiced uh, a displeasure in the movie and is uh, it your brother who was dressed uh, as one at the end or no, no. Yeah, yeah charlie he was uh he was clown clownzilla Zilla. yeah I was so, but yeah but you know in the clown community uh it's kind of like the citizen kane <laughs> of clown <laughs> movies <laughs> yeah. the, the thing about clowns you know is uh um well <laughs> I knew there was a hidden, a hidden inspiration in there. No, no, no. Part, Charles. I, no, I have no, I have no problem with clowns. I, I just, I, I just, uh, I, I forgot what, what I, I was going to say something about, um, you know, uh, uh, people's perception of, of clowns and why. Uh, they're, they're frightened, you know, why they're frightened of them. But uh, well, I, yeah, well, pick up on that. I mean, I heard from some, from some, uh, uh, clown performers that the psychology of it, that children see um, who's behind the mask. They look into the eyes 
and truly can see who's really behind the mask in the eyes and sometimes the personality behind the makeup is different than what the makeup portrays. The makeup might have a big smile, but the eyes might portray something different. And I think that kind of disconnection is what makes some kids kind of fearful of clowns. Because and we were playing with really the idea. Intuitive. Really yeah. intuitive children, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, actually, when I was a little kid, I had a birthday party and my mom, I didn't know she was dressing up as a clown. <laughs> so we went out to get the cake and stuff and she came out dressed as a clown. And me and my, my twin brother went away screaming, hiding our heads like in our grandma's lap, being like, where's our mom? Like, what happened to her? So I, I, I know what happened, you know? It's, it's weird when you're a little kid, too, especially. Yeah. Yes, and usually the parents put you on their lap or something, or they, they, they thrust them on you. And, they, with no, and they're laughing, and they have no perception as to how you're taking it. Mm -hmm. it's scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the conceits in the original movie that you see a clown doing something funny, you'll go right up to them, you'll push your kid to them, hand your kid over to them. <sighs> and uh, in our in our movie, once you get close enough to see that they're not really clowns, it's too late, you know, you're yeah. in their clutches. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, again, talk about, you know, updating it to now, people don't trust clowns, you don't have that, that conceit doesn't work any longer, because people are just inherently distrustful of clowns now. Yeah. because of us because of you yeah for sure it is. <laughs> no yeah <laughs> oh that was uh, that was what i'm saying we intentionally wanted to distance ourselves from clowns that have been portrayed in the past they've been maniacs in makeup that use machetes and baseball bats and murder people we wanted to be different we made them specifically that they were from outer space so they're not going to be confused with men in makeup these were creatures from a clown place that yeah, we've, we always own... shied away from the the yeah. slash of the gore the violence against women you know yeah. people hurting people but a monster can do anything so we yeah. give it that we just run with that and you know that's the separation because you know uh, mm -hmm. it becomes too frightening that you can read that men and women and children are being killed by maniacs because it's too real mm -hmm. The clowns are from outer space. They're fake, you know? Well, they, well, that, that, that's the fun fantasy. part. Yeah, yeah, we could have suspense, we could have thrills, but it's all in fun. So you could look at the film, you can get those those thrills and, and laugh. Some of the, 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 the torture porn, saw films, yeah. they're so realistic that it, it's disturbing for me. And I, I leave the theater not feeling f f fulfilled. I mean, it's just really kind of upsetting. So our film, we try to, uh, to mix horror and comedy. And back then in the 80s, I remember Bob Shea said, comedy and horror don't work. Um, and I think you're right. I think, uh, John, uh, uh, it's a new trend now. I think uh, Tucker and Day Dale uh, save uh, the planet, what, what the hell that Very one is. Funny. Yeah. Very funny. I think comedy and horror are mixing uh, together in ways that are, yeah, I think really enjoyable. I mean, yeah, well, it's always, it was always there, you know, the Freddie quips was always there, but it was like a, a little bit of a non sequitur. Now they're leaning into it more and embracing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so we had uh, we had Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, which to me is the definitive and perfect comedy horror. It doesn't get better than that. Some of the, the other ones, uh, one of my favorite is uh, the, the new uh, Men in Black. I thought Men in Black was a beautiful mix of, of horror and, 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 and comedy and uh, I think now people are realizing it that there is an interest there is a, a definitely an audience for the gore you know that's no denying that but I think when you have young kids you want to bring your kids to something that you know you can sort of they, that they can enjoy without having horrifying nightmares like exorcist uh, movies mm -hmm. and stuff like that you know yeah. with demonic things and uh, you know we like those things too but we grew up with the Ray Harryhausen and Willis O'Brien, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, Monsters, uh, uh, The Journey to the Center of the Earth, Adventures, you know, you know, exciting adventures. Um, and that, I think the family, uh, you can't exclude the little ones. You have to get them excited. Because if we just had gore, we didn't have gore movies when we were little. You know, the gore, the goriest movie was, what, Psycho? And Psycho, was, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know? Bird with the Crystal Plumage. Yeah. And uh, yeah, More psychological. Yeah, it's funny that clowns become sort of like the uh, the horror primer. It's the the family safe uh, horror movie. So, you know, yeah. if, you know, parents are introducing it to their children at three, four five years old. We hear, you know, 
Um, yeah. And it's their favorite it... movie. They watch it over and over again. No, you know, if we, in, in our sequels, if we were given the chance, we can make it scarier, not gorier, but scarier, more suspenseful. We can up the scares a bit, but always give it that little clown spin mm -hmm. that, that makes it unique and killer clowns. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you when I was younger, I did not have an appreciation for Mars Attack because I just couldn't understand why they would make something so dumb. And now that I'm older and I've seen so much more of this genre, I'm like, oh, it's supposed to be funny. And I appreciate the comedy horror that just was lost on me in the 80s, you know? And you so now, saw, oh. Yeah, you saw Tim Burton's uh, Mars Attacks. He did a Tim Burton take on that. Um, I grew up on the 1960s cards, and I think there's a remake to be made serious with Mars Attacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jen, so did you ever see the original uh, Invaders from Mars? No. I well, check that one out. That's really kind of oh. haunting and scary and surrealistic. It's, uh, check it out, different yeah. tone, paranoia. It's never what I was expecting. And so then when I watched the, the Mars Attacks, where it was supposed to be funny, I was like, why is this so dumb? Do they really expect me to fall yeah. for this? It was just so lost on me. And now that I'm older, I'm like, oh, it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did read somewhere that the reason horror and comedy goes well together is because psychologically your mind, there's a buildup for like a punchline for a joke. And then there's buildup for like a scare, like a jump scare. Mm -hmm. So it kind of goes hand in hand the way your mind works. So it really mm -hmm. melts well together. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And in fact, what we ended up doing was the release of, let's say, the shock of a joke or the impact of a punchline or a kill. Uh, a kill, you might gasp and feel anxiety. But with ours, there's a laugh. And the laugh is the way you release the tension. So mm -hmm. to me, it's, it's a more positive experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like an escape, you know. Yeah. Yeah, a little more pleasant escape. Yeah, I don't yeah, think it's I don't, not a heavy one. Yeah, I don't believe that. Uh, I, I don't. I can't recall if anyone was ever killed by getting hit with a pie. <laughs> oh well, John <laughs> Peel did. They did. Unless it was security a guard. <laughs> security guard and killer clowns. <laughs> that's that's what I'm saying. We were the first with all the Laurel and Hardy and the Three Stooges and Avon Costello yeah. pie fights and stuff. No one ever died. <laughs> <laughs> Popcorn, you know, unless there's some allergy or choking thing there. Yeah, so creative. Yeah. No, that's um, right. The, the food allergies will kill yeah. you. <laughs> you were, you were going to mention for your uh, sequel that now Stevens agreed to. Um, you're gonna, uh, you were going to mention that uh, <laughs> uh, about this here, about us being extras on oh. your upcoming film. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was going to say, if you guys do want to cut costs for that bottom line, call us up. We'll fly out for free. You can mm -hmm. kill us off any Violently. way you want. Yes. <laughs> well, when, you get, when the rumors are over and, and we actually do get into production, just give us a call. We'll see what we can do. I think we should auction those parts <laughs> off. We'll be able to finance a movie that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll find some friends. We'll all be extras for free, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Violently no, we, we, die. I don't care. Yeah. We always ask. Uh, they always ask. Uh, you know, we ask them if uh, they would rather kill a clown or be killed by a clown. Mm -hmm. you know, I think people want to be killed. Kill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about what about you, Edward? Would you rather be killed by a clown or kill a clown? I, I, at this point, I'd like killing clowns. <laughs> Does it matter who the clown is? You know. An, an alien or you know something supernatural or your brother in a costume <laughs> but i know the secret so actually funny secret of killing a clown kind of works on anything yeah, yeah. anything shoot in the, the nose, nose yeah shoot the nose, kill the clown. <laughs> um so you let's see we've already talked about the sequel several times so i can skip over that here unless you have more to add to it but i wanted to ask um do you have any of like the strangest or like most bizarre or funniest stories you can tell from like sets of movies that you've been involved with that you'd like to share and feel free to uh you know call each other out or whatever you need to do <laughs> you know like what was the funniest things that happened i mean you know there was a lot of 
crazy stuff that was happening on the set of Team America, but that was, you know, it was so much work and so demanding. Uh, I think, well, Critters comes to mind. I mean, a lot of the times on Critters 1, they built this house, which was the set for the entire film, out in the middle of, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, somewhere out in, in California, Santa Clarita. And uh, so we were operating the, the, the Critter puppets from below. So we were like underneath the floorboards. And we were puppeteering and puppeteering. And all of a sudden, it got really quiet. We didn't hear anybody above. And we were still underneath the, underneath the, t uh, the floor, waiting and waiting. And then we find out that they broke for lunch and nobody told us. <laughs> So it's that kind of disrespect that you get as a as a special effects puppeteer that they don't they don't really regard you as an actor. Oh, <laughs> you're just an so effect. I think on Critters, I was down on Ernest Scared Stupid, but I heard that you guys had an incident when you were doing Critters Two that uh, they were they were the Critters were playing in the kitchen and they were throwing critters, bags of flour around. Critters Three, <laughs> yeah, Critters Three. Yeah. There's three. Yeah, there was. It was that. like a silo fire. You, you were, you were there. So Stephen was there. I was back in the shop, getting ready. Yeah, for it was a shooting. But yeah, it was a kitchen scene, a food fight, and uh, there, the power had gone in this movie. The power went out, so there was everything. Candles lit, lighting up this apartment, and the critters come in in the kitchen and start, you know, throwing food around and bags of flour. And the funny, our effects supervisor was there. Yeah. Even it says, you know, this is how silo explosions happen. And then like a split second later, there was this huge ball of fire that just engulfed the entire set. Yes, all the particulate, all the flour that was in the air like dust uh -huh. caught fire like a flash, poof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. then burned the puppets. It was like the and first day was, of shooting, too. There was a fire marshal on set, but I think he was at craft service. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't know if there was or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, another, another thing, just like in the process of making a movie, Team America, so many bizarre things, just working with, you know, Matt and Trey, brilliant. Uh, Trey in particular is just, you know, just a just really a genius in, in the, the way his mind works and how, you know, how he gets things done. But we're, uh, we're shooting the sex scene. And uh, it's funny, we're, we're on a split unit. We had, this, this movie was so large, we were shooting the bulk of it in Culver City, but then we split a unit and went over to 20th Century Fox to shoot Cairo um, section. But it, during the time I had to go back to Culver City, I was shooting the sex scene. So I brought our lead puppeteer, you know, Tony Urbano back with me. Uh, he's just a brilliant, you know, performer. And, um, they wanted to shoot the, uh, the the bodily function portions of the sex scene, and uh, Tony comes to me and says, "Ed, I don't think I, I can I can't do this. I just it just feels wrong." And, and I sit this one out. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of puppeteer uh, had a line drawn in the sand where he, he just wouldn't go. <laughs> wouldn't go there. A lot of, a lot of puppeteers. Um, they love their craft too much. They respected it too much. And we had problems uh, with them. Matt and Trey had problems with them because they wanted everything to be funny and goofy. They were basically parodying the technique. And some of the puppeteers took it too personal and didn't want to do it that way. They wanted to do it perfect. It was their performance. They wanted a perfect performance. But the perfect performances weren't funny. Um, we, wouldn't, we would still be shooting today if we had to get everything perfect. Um, <laughs> because uh you know 15 foot you know uh strings six puppeteers multiple puppets in a scene you know the amount of takes that it would take we would still be shooting today um but um it was great that when they saw something funny and they laughed and we moved on to the next scene it's funny i remember and, it because uh, it all of a sudden it's become very timely our uh I, the hans blick uh, sequence right now is uh, becoming very popular on YouTube uh, and up there. And, uh, you know, it's funny that uh, the first time we shot that, um, it's, a, it's a real baby shark that that uh, attacks the puppet. And the, the first time we did it, the, the shark died. <laughs> oh. oh, no. Oh, man. The baby shark. <laughs> Not because no. of the puppet. There was something wrong with the, with with the, the water. 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 <laughs> oh, dang. But, uh, you know, but th th that that's the cool thing about that movie is everything is practical. Everything you see in that movie is real. We did it on camera, except yeah, there's no, one, no, one blue no screen, puppets. one green screen shot. No puppets were harmed in the making of Team America. <laughs> Just one shark. Yeah. One shark, one baby, yeah. 
Do you get to keep any uh, any uh, props? Uh, unfortunately oh. not. No. Uh, and those props don't last very long. They're made with a natural rubber, foam rubber latex, and over a, a year or two, they start to deteriorate. So hardly anything's really left. Yeah, so they're rotting somewhere in Paramount storage right now. Oh, they're <laughs> supposed to be rotting in a museum, but yeah. Yeah. No, actually, South Park's got a, a full set of the puppets on display. Have you seen them recently? No, I mean, if they don't touch them, they'll they'll dry out in that condition, <laughs> you know, but... <laughs> Yeah, I'd like, like to we see. Didn't, we didn't preserve them before we we set them up there, so who knows? What was yeah, it we, like uh, filming that puking scene? <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, they came up with it. Uh, they gave it a pea green color. They put, I think they put, they they ripped up Tootsie Rolls and put it in there and bacon oh. bits, oh. you know, to give it some chunks. Is it methyl cellulose? Yeah, it's a little bit of everything. Yeah, methyl cell. Yeah, and uh, there was a lot of it, and uh, they were pumping it through the puppet, and then when it was running out, it started spurting air and stuff, which they were, you know, Matt and Trey cracked up laughing, and they go, no, let's do that, keep the air coming, and they kept it going and going, yeah, yeah, I just, I got to design the, uh, the puddle, they wanted the big puddle, so I had a, you know, I, I made the giant puddle and put him in his face in it. But yeah, actually, are, that was that was part of the pickups that, that wasn't in the original script. They added that the bar scene with the uh, three types of people with the bum in the bar and then the vomiting sequence that was done pretty much, I think, like two weeks before the movie came out. Oh. <laughs> That's yeah. a really funny scene, too. <clears throat> so I'm learning here, you know, I'm learning from you guys about special effects, how you know what ingredients you need for, for the puke. Flour is flammable, but it's got air in it. I learned this with dry um, creamer, dry coffee creamer. Don't pour it onto a flame. So yes, very that's similar. Mind. Yeah, it is. yeah, yeah. So I'm learning a lot here. You also, you know, what you're making out of it only lasts a year or two before it deteriorates. So this is good. Yeah. Thank Just you. Learn something every day. Yes. Yes. Well, there's a new there's a new uh, career that's been made because there are people now that are hired to restore the deteriorated foam rubbers, puppets from the 70s and 80s and 90s. And all we had to do was spray some acrylic on it and seal it. Um, that's all we had to do. But back then the prop was made to be used on set and discarded. Um, now they realize that there's a value to collectible movie props yeah i'm still of the mind you know we build a prop for its usage in the movie to me that's the ultimate remembrance of the item as seen in the movie mm -hmm. you know it's, it's cool having something left afterwards but it's, it's made for a purpose mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and some of that stuff goes for big money you know i mean you know the, the the makeup a friend of ours has the uh the original uh cowardly lion from mgm's Wizard of Oz. Of Oz wow. Those suits go for like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Jeez. You know? And, and now now with your new potato head clown, you can make a limited edition. You know what? That's a great idea for you know a Mr. Potato Head clown that you can put different eyes and you know hair on it. That's that's the perfect thing. So somebody's gonna do it. Hours of fun. <laughs> or no, you don't play with it. You put it in its collector case for later when it's a million dollars. I was thinking of a chia pet. A killer clown chia pet would be yeah. really great too. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, oh, you were gonna ask him uh, about this. Uh so where can we keep up with your current and future projects? Do you guys have uh social media? Oh uh, yeah, there's the, the Kyoto Brothers uh webpage, you know, on, on we have our KyotoBrothers.com website, which isn't great. Uh, Facebook, um, Instagram. No, we're really bad at that. We're our worst PR person. I mean, our, our website isn't that good either. We're just too busy working. We don't have time for that. So no, no, you, know, you, can find, you can find us. Your face, the Facebook page, uh, Kyoto Brothers yeah. uh, Facebook page is, you know, if and when anything cool happens, uh, we post it there. You know, our appearances, we uh, finally now coming out of the pandemic, we're doing a bunch of appearances this year. We're going to be in Seattle later on in uh, May, uh, Watsonville, Santa Cruz, where we shot the movie in the uh, beginning of May. Of course, Monster Palooza in Pasadena in June. Uh, Horror Hound in, uh, when is that? 
our hound in Cincinnati later on this year in the fall. And we're going to Texas too, right? Somewhere? In August. So we're going to meet the, the fans. No, that's the fun part. You know, meeting meeting the fans and, and hearing what, what they liked and didn't like about the film and, you know, the obvious questions. When's the, when's the next one coming out? And <laughs> tell them that, you know what? If it was up to us, we would have done it 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's, it's out of our hands. And, yeah, you know, you know if, we, if, we, if we controlled the, prob- uh, the property, we'd be up to kill clowns ad nauseum by now. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, up. now it'd probably be a lot more appreciated than it would have 20 years ago. You know, I think you're right. Following. Yep. Yeah. We'll start a petition for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Write a letter to MGM. Tell them how much you love it. Actually, the cool thing that we that'd be really neat, uh, John Massari, the composer, he's been really uh, yeah. kind of pushing a uh, different version. He has the orchestral version that hopefully will get a, is going to be released on uh, CD uh, at some point. Maybe even uh, he's trying to get MGM to release a version of the, the orchestral score to the movie. But then his, uh, he's hoping to take the live concert event out on tour. Oh, and, awesome. and that is that is a treat. It was a one time thing only so far here in Los Angeles a couple of years ago, and it was phenomenal. So uh, some things like that really excite me because it presents the movie in, an, in a very new and unique way that just adds a, an incredible new element depth to it that you know, we had never really anticipated. Yeah, and, and maybe bringing it to Vegas because I saw the Evil Dead the musical in Vegas and I loved that. Yeah, that's so amazing. <laughs> that like experience of just being sprayed with the fake blood and you got like a target on you. It was just in their singing. It was so silly. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Killer Clowns from Outer Space the musical is a natural, you know. Oh, work for the re- reanimator of the musical. That was brilliant, Stuart yeah. Gordon's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Does reanimator the musical? Write yeah. it down. You gotta watch it. <laughs> The list I have to watch. Oh, it was great. No, it was a live show. It was, it was a, live. It was a stage show. It uh, played here in Los Angeles, uh, Chicago, and then off Broadway, New York for a little while. But Stewart unfortunately passed away, you know, recently. So I'm not sure, what, you know, if there's any video of it out there anywhere. But if you can, if the, anybody ever videoed and put it on YouTube, check it out. It's yeah, it's, search it's for brilliant. It. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't, I can't believe that somebody wouldn't have recorded it. I'm sure somebody has it recorded somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Had a splash zone too. It's really fun. Yeah, the first yeah. couple of rows were the splash zone. <laughs> it's called like the splatter zone. I, I loved it. It would be perfect. Yeah. But what's your favorite films? What, 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 what inspired you to get into this genre? Me? Yes, both of you. Oh, um, well, I, uh, I wasn't allowed to watch anything super scary when I was growing up. Um, even Harry Potter was too much. So um, I really, I really got into it. You can thank my brother, who I'm still really close with. My brother, he's only a year older than me. But um, what happened was I was really into Lord of the Rings, and he was like, "Oh, there's a new movie coming out called The Ring. Let's go see it." And I was like, oh, I love Lord of the Rings. A different kind of ring. I didn't see any trailer. I wasn't ready for this at all. You know, you do. So so we go in and that first scene where she's in the closet and then my face was covered for half of the rest of the movie because I was so traumatized. I was not ready at all to watch something this terrifying. And then it was a whole new like level of, oh, I have seven days until I'm going to, like, I really feel like it's going to happen to me now. I just watched that whole thing. I have to bring all my friends, of course, you know? And so then I had to go back and bring all my friends. I'm like, look at this. And it was just like that exhilarating kind of like, it just opened a whole new door to me. And so I, I really got into that. And then it took me a while before I think I matured enough to really understand the comedy behind it. Um, that that new TV show that came out with Kristen Bell, the girl in the window across the street from whatever, you know, I'm like, <laughs> I just appreciate that so much now, you know, <laughs> all great. the details. So that's that's what got me into it. Thank my brother. I think what got me into it was, I still remember, I think I was like six or seven years old, maybe. And my parents wouldn't let me watch like the horror films. But one day I was at the grocery store and I'm like, oh, just go read some comic books or magazines. And I saw my first issue of Fangoria. 
<laughs> I was looking at like Freddy Krueger stuff in there. I'm like, what is this awesome new world that's been opened up to me? Mm-hmm. Got in trouble, got grounded. <laughs> And then I had to find those films and watch them. So that's kind of what got me into it. And if you go on his Instagram, you'll see his artwork. He does um, the digi- all the digital artwork. He's very good at, at all of these digital illustrations for creatures and ma- and it's uh, so, yeah. He, he, he's it out. developing, it you out. know, like the characters, uh, the character design and then, and then uh, using his Photoshop ways. So he's Very cool. pretty good at it. Wait, well, guys, you know what? I have a three o'clock meeting I've got to go to. So it's great talking to you guys are really ask good questions. I really enjoyed the time speaking to you and we'll check yeah, out. And your, thank your, you so much yeah. for meeting with us, yeah, for taking the time. I'm sorry. It took so long. I was just going to let it go as long as you would let me. So thank you so much. You can All talk right. to these guys if you want. I, it's just me I having to go. Well. <laughs> no, actually, we, I didn't want to bring this up, but we actually are seeing the Batman. So we're actually leaving in like 10 minutes, so. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> good. Okay, well, enjoy the movie. It's great talking to you guys. Take care. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and um, we'll be talking to you later, I hope. All right, well, sure. Anytime. Anytime. Thanks a lot, Thank guys. you. Bye. Bye.